Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews. This is the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of Canada. Now, today we are honored to be sitting down and speaking with Kitchener City Councillor Ayo Uwudini. Kitchener is an innovative, caring, and vibrant community. They have a proud history of community building, inspiring and supporting people to work together to create a city that feels like home for everyone. Now, it's a place where people from across Canada and around the world come to put down roots. Kitchener is a place where people have a passion for city building. They're inspired by what Kitchener is becoming and want to be part of its vibrant future. So stay tuned and we'll be right back after a quick message with cross-border interviews featuring Councillor Ayo Uwudini. Are you looking for a team of experienced professionals to help develop a strategic plan for your municipality? Look no further. At Strategic Steps, their team of experts has years of experience working in municipal administration. They take a comprehensive approach to planning, carefully listening to your community's needs, and working closely with your council to develop a homegrown strategy tailored to your unique community. Contact Strategic Steps today to learn more about how they can help you create a brighter future for your community. Call Strategic Steps at 780-416-9255 or visit strategicsteps.ca to get started. Councillor, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I want to start by getting to know the man behind the persona a little bit, if you don't mind. And I've got to ask the question I've asked every single person who's ever come on the show, so you're no exception. Where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Io? Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here, Chris. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so I was born and raised in Nigeria, in Lagos, Nigeria, to be exact. I moved to Canada uh, eight years now. I moved here in 2016. So growing up, I always, um, during the summertime, I would go visit my grandma. And my grandma lived in a village uh, back in, well, I won't call it a village. It's, a, I'll call it a city called Ibado. And um, the way the houses were set up, the fences were very low. You know, they had, the doors were always open. I never knew my grandma had a door for years because people just came out and, you know, went in and out. It was that kind of setting. And interestingly, people would come and talk about their life story or their problems or marriage or one issue or another. And she was like the elder in the community. My job over the summertime was, of course, playing soccer and, you know, breaking people's windows and hiding behind grandma and all of those wonderful things. But I think seeing those things, you don't realize how much it subconsciously is being planted in you, the desire to serve in the community um, and the desire to see people around you do well, get better, improve, encouragement, that type of thing. So it started out with grandma. My mom owned a school. I went to my mother's school in uh, Nigeria as well. And it was the same thing. My mom was called auntie for many years. In fact, growing up, we called her auntie. Uh, we never called her mom because it was kind of weird. Everyone else called her auntie. But people were always over the house. Uh, in fact, my, my brother's name for my mom was Mother Teresa because there were always people living in our house that we didn't know. We had no idea who they were. And she would always say, you know, they couldn't pay their school fees. Like, what am I supposed to do? Leave them alone? I took them in so that at least they have a place to stay. They have food to eat and they can go to school. And she did that for decades. In fact, <laughs> Chris, just a few weeks ago. I'm going to call with my mom and there's someone in the house. And I'm like, who is this person? <laughs> Keep in mind, she's 77 now. And there are young people in the house. And she's like, where are they going to live? Oh, I just helped them, to, you know, to school, that kind of thing. She's been doing it for decades. And we wouldn't want it in any other way. So I, I would say from my grandma and my mom, they've really impacted me to desire to serve in the community. I'm just serving in a different capacity, but ultimately it's still service. So this show is about that capacity that you have decided to put your name forward. And in 2022, you put your name forward for the city of Kitchener Councillor Ward 5 position, and you were successful. Now, from the records I can find, this is the first and only time you have put your name forward for municipal office. Is that correct? Yes, I got my citizenship probably two or three weeks right before the nomination cutoff. So. I was like, oh, well, let's use it. I have a mentor who used to be a former mayor who said, 
hey, why don't you use this as an opportunity to learn? You know, go out there, knock on doors, get to meet the community. People already know you, but go out there, get to meet them, talk to them, find out what their issues are, concerns, and say, hey, I'm running for office. If you lose, you learn. We have nothing to lose, Ayo. And that was the approach that we we, we went. Uh, and uh, somehow, some way, yeah, it worked. <laughs> Why municipal? And I think that's the crux of this entire interview is what was it about the municipal realm? Because that 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 mentor, that former mayor could have said, go provincial, go federal. But was it just because a few weeks prior you had gotten your citizenship? So you thought, well, here's an election. Here's the perfect opportunity. Or was there a draw to the municipal realm for IO? One, I think it's local. Um, so it was easy to grasp in my head and understand the concepts because, you know, I live in a community and I, I, I'm impacted by that. Two, I, I've had a chance to meet the uh, the mayor, uh, Mayor Barry Vibanovic, before that. Um, I've had a chance to go to the state of the city address. My background is a management consultant. So prior to that, I've had a chance to meet him, to meet the former CAO before he had retired. Uh, so I'd built some sort of relationship and I sort of had an idea of how the city worked. Um, so for me, it was just an easier decision. Um, and provincial and federal seem like just there was a lot to learn. They're always fighting. You know, there's all of these things happening <laughs> over there. Someone asks a question and someone answers, but somehow they did not answer the question. <laughs> I, it, like it just fascinated me it was a different world and i was just like you know what that's like the the big leagues no you know what let me stay where i know that i know what the issues and the concerns are and i can easily walk down the street to um to knock on doors and talk to people so for me that that was why uh, we decided to go with uh, uh municipal so that brings up the follow-up question because it sounds like you have a pulse on what the community was looking for what the community wanted and the issues of your community but when you go door knocking, that's a different beast in itself. That is a unique situation where you hear the truly granule issues, the issues that are affecting the mom and dads, the, the neighbors, the community members, the families, the seniors in your community. When you were door knocking, did you, I don't want to say were you taken back, but did you hear issues that you hadn't even heard of and you went, oh, I didn't think this was happening in our community. And I'm so glad someone actually brings it up because if I get elected, I can potentially help solve that issue for this person. Funny enough, when I first started out and I would meet with my mentor just to get advice, the first thing he said to me, I had two meetings with him. And then he said, I don't want to talk. Do you to mind me asking who it enough. is? I don't want to share it here, <laughs> uh, but he was one of the former mayors uh, for the city of Kitchener from back in the 80s, um, um, uh, Mayor Richard, uh, the former Mayor Richard, uh, forgotten his last name all of a sudden, but uh, his name is Richard, and um, Richard said, you know what, I you go knock on hundreds of doors first, and then come back and tell me what you're hearing, uh, and, and I really appreciated that he pushed me and challenged me to, to to do it. Remember, my ward is largely Caucasian. And here is this immigrant who is fairly new in the country. Here's this black guy who is new in the community as well. I wasn't really sure how people would be open to a six foot four black guy knocking on their doors. And Chris, let me tell you, I was blown away. People invited me into the home. Old ladies brought out cookies for me. I, I'll never forget one guy brought out a chair one day. When you know when someone is bringing out a chair, that you know that's a long conversation. <laughs> you're, you're telling so, your staff members, just go to the next door. I'm going to be here for an hour or two. I just, <laughs> yeah, just, just go. Leave me alone. I'll be here for a while. And we had to develop a strategy around, okay, if you see me longer than five minutes, you got to come by and say, okay, we have to go, Aya. We have to go. And I'll blame it on you, you know, so I don't get in trouble. But I would say the number one most controversial thing, we asked the same question every door. You know, what are some concerns and issues that you're having right now? And we always wrote it all down. We wrote it all down. And at the end, we came up with this like one page Excel document, which I handed to my CAO as soon as I arrived. And I said, here are the issues of people in Ward 5 summarized for you in terms of units and the, the streets and the areas and the concerns. Um, the, the the most controversial issue 
that came up uh, was uh, bike lanes. Now, over the past few years, we have been building these bike lanes so people can bike a lot more downtown. And and I believe over time, the goal was to further extend it. So we've we've changed some street dynamics. It's no longer two-way. It's one-way with bike lanes and all of that stuff. I, I remember I knocked on a door one day and the person said, you know, it's the dumbest thing I've ever seen and it's a total waste of money. It's stupid. You guys are stupid. And I'm like, I, I'm not in yet. That, like, <laughs> I'm just knocking on that door. Why are you calling? Okay, but thank you. The very next house literally was like, you know what, Io? The bike lanes is the best decision that we've made as a city. So I'm like, okay, your neighbor just said it was the... You know, the dumbest thing. I go, yeah, I know. He doesn't bike. But we bike. And it's the best thing. So literally, I started. I actually started asking, like, what do you think of the bike lane? And it was 50%. 50% of people feeling like it's stupid. It doesn't make sense. Costing too much money. And 50% feeling it's the best thing, you know, since sliced bread, um, quote unquote. So at the end of the day, as, as a counselor, how do you navigate 50% saying great and 50% saying not so great? More importantly, usually it's only one party that comes out to council meetings for delegation. So they tend to get the presence. They tend to get the voice. So it, it just shows how complicated some of these decisions can be. And from right there and then, I, I think I start to realize, wow, I, you're going to have to make some controversial decisions where 50% of people are just not going to be happy with you, depending on which direction that you go are you willing to live with that you know so so i'm going to talk about, i'm going to talk about some of the challenges that a counselor faces in a few seconds but you brought up something that i can't let slide because um you mentioned the fact that you're a six foot four black man who campaigned in a predominantly caucasian neighborhood and i say that Knowing that for those who are listening, I'm a white man asking a black man this question. So please, if you're about to send some very rude questions, uh, emails to me, please don't. I'm asking for educational purposes here. I have tried to pride myself to try to get a more diverse group of counselors on this show. I recently had the pleasure of sitting down with uh, the counselor from Ingersoll, Khadija Hadd. Haliru. I I will get names (laughs) correct here. And she was the first woman, Muslim woman to be elected to that council. From what I understand, you were the first black man to be elected to a city council in the city of Kitchener. Prior to, and I asked this question knowing I'm going to get emails, but I've got to ask, prior to running, did you consider yourself a black man who was running or a Kitchener resident running to be the next counselor? I just saw myself as a Kitchener resident. I love this community that was looking to run. Uh, In fact, I remember after I won, uh, there were a few places that I went and I was introduced as the first Black City Counselor in Kitchener. And I specifically requested uh, that people stop introducing me that way. I'm a Kitchener resident. One thing that I really appreciated about Ward 5 residents, they were so, I was impressed and I was shocked that I felt it was important that I said it everywhere I go. They were so open to having conversations. I don't think people necessarily saw color. They just saw someone that wanted to serve. And I was I was just shocked that single mothers would open their door and they saw a six foot four black guy. They didn't run away. They didn't hide. They had a conversation with me. Some people said, come inside. And, and I remember there was a guy, it was raining and I had my raincoat on and we're talking and he said, come inside. And, you know, in the back of my mind, I'm like, really? You really want me to come inside? (laughs) So I'm like, no, it's okay. I'll stand out here. And then after a while, he goes, dude, it's raining outside. It's 10 degrees. You must be freezing. Come inside now. Like, what are you doing? (laughs) And it hit me. Wait a minute. To him, it doesn't make sense. Like, okay, I'll just go inside. (laughs) And we had a great conversation uh, as well. And Honestly, I was just blown away by the openness of people. Initially, I was nervous, but six weeks into door knocking, it didn't bother me. I didn't think twice about it anymore. Whether it was 7 p.m. at night or whatever, we were more than open to having conversations with people. 
And even people that did not like politicians or didn't trust us, they were very respectful in how they handled it. Hey, I don't trust politicians. I don't like talk, talking to politicians. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Thank you. And that was the worst that I experienced, you know? So for me, it was a phenomenal eye-opening experience that we don't talk much about. I don't know. Does it mean people had changed over time? Were people just open to it? Or people just simply were open to, hey, you want to serve my community? I appreciate that. And till today, I still receive that respect from people. Whenever I go to events, my meet and greets, conversations, there is this genuine desire to have a conversation, get to know me, and just have a chat. In fact, Chris, there is a, a group of, um, and they're going to send me an email for this. It was a. a, a an, this is the email show hockey. for those who are watching. Just send us all emails if you want. We love emails. We follow them in the appropriate locations. <laughs> well, there was a um, all women's ice hockey team. It was like a fifty-plus-year-old team, and I remember we had some athletic awards event. So I was walking door uh, table to table, saying hello, and I got to this group, and I said. Are you a field hockey team? And they were so offended, you know? And they're like, how dare you call us a field hockey team? So, you know, I apologized like 20 times. And one of the ladies went, she went up to give a, an award and she said, to that city councilor that called us a field hockey team, we challenge you on the, I've never <laughs> skated a day in my life. You know, I'm like, oh gosh. <laughs> uh, they're like, we challenge you to come on the ice next week and join us and watch how easy you claim it is. <laughs> like they just went, a, of course, we all laughed about it or whatever, but it, it's just the openness and, and um, the willingness for people to see beyond color, to have conversations and just see me as another resident in Kitchener. Do and I deeply appreciate that. There are probably people in this country right now who live in predominantly white communities who are just like you, who have your story, who have come to this country or were raised in this country, who are black, Muslim, you name it, the diversities can just strengthen my opinion. What advice would you give those Canadians listening to this right now to say, I want to be the next counselor. I want to be the next mayor of my community to help out, but I'm not sure if my experience is going to be the exact same as IO's. So I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to put my name forward or will my community support me? Will they look at me as a black man or will they look at me as just another neighbor who wants the best for their community? What advice would you give that Canadian right now who's listening to this? Go out and serve your community. When you serve your community, I think people will see the genuineness. Um, you cannot control the hearts of people. You cannot control what they're thinking. You cannot control the bias. You cannot control all of those things. And many times we tend to focus on what we cannot control. You focus on what you can control. Go out and serve. Show your genuineness. Show people that you care about your community. Show them that you're passionate. Don't you just say three words? Show it in your actions. Hey, when we had our Earth Day, I was there. When we had our Easter bunny chasing the egg, whatever that thing is called. We don't have those in Nigeria, by the way, Chris. So I, I don't remember the name. Easter egg hunt. That's what it's called. I was there. When we had to run a 5K and I almost died at 3K, I was there. When we were raising money for cancer research, I was there. When the field hockey team, you know, is uh, you ice hockey, the ice, ice hockey ice, team. Ice hockey. <laughs> I don't want to get emails, counselor. Come on. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. I, uh, all right. Well, the ice hockey team, you know, they're there. You accidentally call them a field hockey team, but then you apologize. You reach out to them. Those are things that you can do in your community. And I guarantee robots, people see those things. And for them. The questions they're going to ask you at the door is, who are you? Why should I vote for you? What are you bringing to the table? What have you done? It was the same four questions I was asked. And I was able to turn it into a pitch. But once people heard it, they were more than willing to have a conversation with me. You know, So if you just be your genuine self and serve the community, 
Canadians love when you serve their community. So you serve the community and you will win the hearts of people, period. I want to turn back to the role of a counselor for a second, and I appreciate you taking time to answer those questions. Um, you mentioned the fact that during the campaign, you found that there was an issue, bike lanes, that you had 50% of the people in favor and 50% of the people who just opposed it. Now, you are coming up to two years in office here in October of this year of 2024. I can imagine you've come to the realization that that doesn't just extend to bike lanes, but that extends to every single issue you have ever made on council, <laughs> that you are not Absolutely. getting 100% of the fund. How do you make that tough decision? Because at the end of the day, you were right. The people who are passionate about an issue come to council. Now, that doesn't mean the both sides of every issue is coming to council. Some are just one side and you have to make that tough decision. How do you make the decision that is going to be in the best interest of the entire community, knowing that you're going to potentially upset someone with that decision making process? I would say it's probably the hardest part of this job. It is the hardest part of this job, knowing that whichever direction you go, you're going to um, you're going to take somebody off. Some people are going to question your decision. Some people are going to say developers have paid you off. You're going to have all sorts of different things said about you. And the best advice I got was uh, from another mentor of mine. Um, and she said, you know what, Ayo, you read the documents, you do your own research, and you make the best decision based on the information you have. And I really loved how she worded that. You're making the best decision based on the information that you have. And just make sure you have a clean, uh, a clear conscience uh, on this. Uh, have a clean conscience when you when you make your decisions. The former mayor of Kitchener, Carl Zura, one day I was grabbing coffee with him and he shared a story with me. He said the current city hall for the city of Kitchener was extremely controversial when the decision was being made to build it. I believe the number in the terms of final vote was like six to five or something. Like it was not majority. It was literally plus one vote. And people were extremely angry frustrated it was in the media like the town the city hall was full when they made that decision and he said here we are 25 whatever years later everyone is using that city hall there are a lot of events that take place at that city hall our staff has grown you know and we use it for so many different purposes nobody remembers that 25 years ago it was a major controversial decision. So he was like, you just have to go and have to, you're gonna have to stick to your guns. You're gonna have to read the information that you have, do your own research, and you just have to be comfortable with the decision. Listen to the people, listen to the different sides, but always, and I thought this was really important, be a voice for those that don't show up as well. Because many times, like you said, it's the passionate that show up. But how about that immigrant who has not even decided that Kitchener is going to be home? How about that person moving from Toronto or Brampton in the next two, three years have not decided that Kitchener is going to be home? Or how about that person who's just simply afraid to come in because there are 60 people that are going to fill the hall and they're the only one, you know, at the end of the day. So you cannot make a decision just based on those that came. You have to, in your mind, speak for the, uh, be a voice for the voiceless as well. And that is probably the hardest part because you're going to have to, you're thinking, okay, these people are here, they're making a delegation and they can wear you out with delegation because it's five minutes per person. You don't say counselor. Making a delegation. <laughs> <laughs> the power of wearing you down. <laughs> but the other side is afraid to come in. The other side might be perfectly fine with it. So they don't even decide to show up or, provide a voice uh, in terms of this. So it, it is so tough. Can, can you I ask you a question on that statement decision. here? Do you Go find ahead. there's an apathy in a Kitchener? When you ask people for their opinion, when there's a controversial opinion, like we have said in this show already, the one side who's passionate about it, who either disagrees with it or does not want it, usually is the one that will come out and do something about that issue. And I say that respectfully because they have the right to do that in our democracy. Absolutely. That is what Canadian democracy is built on. 
But on average, I would say there's an apathetic nature in this country when it comes to the issues that are facing municipal municipal politics and municipal governments in this country. Do you find that in the city of Kitchener? And how do you ensure that both sides are spoken to? Because at the end of the day, if there's an apathetic nature, people aren't going to want to talk to people or communicate with their politicians say, okay, I'm going to have to spend 15 minutes on the phone explaining my side. I'll just go on social media and rant about it on Facebook or X or Instagram or threads or whatever social media platform, TikTok, for God's sakes. How do you ensure that you're engaging with people in a meaningful way? Because social media is great, but social media can be a farm of unknown anonymous people who you don't know if they're actually even in Kitchener or not. You're, you're very right about that. So a few things that I have tried out now, remember, I'm still a rookie. I'm still only a year and a few months in. Um, I was privileged to be invited to some of the Facebook group of residents in my ward. So different streets and different community groups have their own Facebook group. Uh, and, you know, when you're the counselor trying to join a closed Facebook group, they might not let you in sometimes, but all of them invited me in. So what I started to do is once a week, I would record a video and I would post in the Facebook, hey, here's what we discussed at council, or hey, here's a controversial decision coming up, or hey, uh, we would love your feedback on this or whatever it is that would like your thoughts on it. So I started to do that uh, more frequently. And what I have noticed was initially not many people responded, but I think people noticing that, okay, this guy is trying to connect with people and just hear them out. I'm noticing more and more people are responding to my messages in the groups. Um, so in fact, I collect it and I'm able to go through it. And that also gives me an idea of which, you know, what people are thinking. Now, is everyone in Ward 5 in those Facebook groups? Absolutely not. We're about 20 something thousand in the ward and there's only a few of them. Um, do I get an email from everyone during that time? Not really as well. It's usually people that are upset, angry, or frustrated about something, or there is a major issue happening in their street that would reach out, you know, at, at the end of the day. I believe there is apathy. A voter turnout was very low. It was 20% or lower um, for our municipal elections. When I went door to door knocking, many people did not even know there was an election coming up in a few months at that point. And many well, people did not. To understand. give them credit, to give them credit, it was a little bit weird time because it was right after it was the global pandemic was still kind of raging on. You had a federal election, yeah. you had a provincial election that year. Literally, That's at, true. <laughs> I've gone through many municipal uh, elections in Ontario where there's been a provincial and the apathy just, oh, another one? No, oh, God. I, like, it's the forgotten cousin that was in the some phrase. sense. <laughs> that is the phrase. There's another election. Like, which one is this one? And we are a four-tiered system. So we have our regional uh, council. So they're having their own election as well. So, <laughs> you know, people are getting flyers or they tell me something and I go, oh, that's not the responsibility of municipal. That's the regional response. And, you know, you can see people just throw their hands up in the air like, I don't care. Just fix it. You know, that's what they want. Uh, so... I do think there's a responsibility of us politicians to find a way to be a step closer to the people, whether that is ensuring that you are at different community events, um, connecting with local associations, finding ways to meet with people, finding ways to connect with people. So that way, when the need arises, when you need to hear from them, it's easier for you to send a message to all of them. So um, I went door to door knocking last year, even after election, just to check in on my constituents. Um, our my, my plan this year during the summer is to go door knocking again. Uh, just, hey, I'm just here to check in on you just to see how things are going. And here's what I discovered. People appreciated me checking in a lot more. And to all the other counselors and mayors, they were actually more willing to give me their email address and contact details. <laughs> They were so open to having a conversation and just to say, hey, here are where things are. You still not solved this issue, Aya. You said you were going to. Hey, what happened to that stop sign thing you know, that we talked about? And it, 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 was, it was so helpful. And it hold, keeps me accountable. 
And I think the day that I'm afraid to go door to door knocking, it's possibly the day I need to step down, you know. But at this point, they're still more than willing to have a conversation with me and talk. Uh, just last week, Chris, um, we voted on a decision that a delegation and a few other people were not happy with. Um, and one of the delegates reached out to me afterwards and was still grateful that, hey, thank you for listening. Thank you for acknowledging. Really do appreciate it. We're not happy with the decision, but thank you. And I was so grateful for that. You rarely hear anything like that. Yeah. I, I was so thankful for, you know, um, that individual being open and willing to uh, reach out to share that message with me. So I, I, I just realized we're at a half hour mark and I haven't even turned to segment two yet. So I'm going to quickly turn to segment two, if you don't mind. And hopefully you have an extra 10 right. minutes for me here. Um, I want to sure. talk about the city of Kitchener as a whole here. And as I always do on the show, so that way you don't send me your emails as you often do on the show, please remember that this is a conversation between the counselor and myself. This is not a motion of counsel. This is not a direction of counsel. This is not even a <laughs> policy of counsel. This is his opinion and his opinion alone. Uh, thank you for your emails to the people of Kitchener who are about to send them to me. <laughs> counselor. No, no your purpose. <laughs> Counselor, in your opinion, what do you believe is the biggest issue facing the city of Kitchener today? Affordable housing. We're going through a major housing crisis. Uh, Kitchener is growing by 5,000 uh, individuals a year. Now, keep in mind that number that I'm sharing, that does not add Conestoga College, you know, or international students that are coming in Um uh, uh, through our different universities and our college as well. So we are in a major housing crisis and we have a situation where the only way that we get revenue as a city is through property taxes, you know, your gas utility rates, that's it. So how do you address a, an issue that, by the way, not many people know this, federal government stopped building uh, back in the 90s, affordable housing. So I would say we're 40 something years behind, you know, in terms of what we're trying to do. The city does not build, developers build. Our job is to create an enabling environment for them to be able to build, you know. Uh, so it's a major crisis. We have a target that was, um, we were challenged by the province to be able to build, uh, I believe it's 35,000 homes uh, in five years. So we're doing everything that we can to be able to build you know, to be able to create that enabling environment for our developers so that they can build. We're looking at all sorts of different policies. We're, we just, uh, a few weeks ago, um, pushed through inclusionary zoning around our major transit areas. So if you are, uh, if you're going to be building within 800 meters of our light rail uh, system or bus system, you're going to have to provide 2% of affordable housing. There are some counselors and I agree with them where they felt that is not enough. Yes, that is not enough, but it's something, you know, it's a start. So we're rezoning and providing some greater opportunities for developers as well to be able to build more around our major transit areas as well. Uh, just a few weeks ago, one of the counselors brought a motion to, um, to council, and I really loved it, where it was basically let's look at all our parking lots as a city, and is there a way in partnership with Habitat for Humanity and, you know, um, getting some grants and some funding from the federal government for us to be able to build some affordable housing on our currently existing parking lots? By the way, are there any other assets that the city owns that we are able to provide? I believe City of Guelph is probably doing the same thing as well. So we're looking at what tools do we have to be able to get us going? As a city, I know the region is doing their best as well at this point in time. The federal government have been making some announcements around the housing accelerator fund uh, that will be provided to different cities that uh, if they hit their targets, which we're pushing and we're currently on target to hit our five year target, um, you have access to this. Um, I don't know what percentage we are going to get, but to these billions of dollars that we provided for affordable housing. 
I did meet someone yesterday, uh, Chris. Uh, I, I grabbed coffee with a few friends, and this individual, you know, very passionate, kept saying, "You are not doing enough, Aya. We still need affordable housing." That person works for an organization that provides affordable housing for people that are in need, and the waiting list is long. We know that. Um, our uh, the homelessness yeah. crisis is is major. So there is so much happening. And we're doing the best that we can to address it. Okay, there's a few things I want to ask, but I want to ask the stupid million dollar question. And you've mentioned it a little, <laughs> you've, you've mentioned it a few times already, but I want to sort of play in that sandbox if you don't mind. Housing is not a municipal issue. Now you can you can create all the uh, the environment so that way builders want to come in. It's true. You do not build houses, but what you do are, are municipalities are responsible for is the infrastructure, 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 infrastructure. Right. And right. those come together. You cannot build houses without the infrastructure in place to build those houses. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. things are, I'm not sure if you've checked the gas prices these days, but things are going up in this world. <laughs> and I say that respectfully, but things are costing more to do things. <laughs> You are trying to build, you are trying to play catch up for a 40 year old issue around housing when you were playing in the reality of 2024 and not 1970s house prices and infrastructure prices. How do you balance, and I say you as you and council, how do you balance the, the needs of the community today with the environment, the economic environment that we live in with the realities of what your community is facing? Because you do not want to raise your taxes 10, 15, 20% every year to offset some of these infrastructure projects that will help build these houses. But if you don't, <laughs> you're, you're looking at not a 40 year issue, a hundred year issue in 2020, 20, it, it is, you know, that individual that I said uh, came to council and uh, was, was a delegate. Um, Part of his concern is why are you building this 700 unit or why are you allowing this to be built in our community? That type of thing. That was the question that I asked them. And I said, hey, we're growing about 5,000 a year. Where are these people going to live, sir? Like, help me. Just help me. I, I, I did not grow up in urban planning, whatever. I don't have a background in economics. I am new in the country. Uh, maybe there's something you know that I do not know. So help me out. What are we supposed to do? We're growing at 5,000 a year, excluding international students that are coming in. Not just people coming in. We have built an enabling environment that people love this city and they want to come live here. We cannot put a sign on the 401 that says you are not welcome. We do not want you to turn around. We cannot do that. We cannot put a sign at our entrances to the city of Kitchener. Welcome to the city of Kitchener. We do not want you. Turn around. Go away. We don't have housing. We cannot do that. So where do we put these people? And I mean, I appreciate it. I think his response was more, well, that's why you're the counselor. <laughs> <laughs> that's why you guys are in the hot seat. But yes, but you are telling me I'm not making a good decision. You're challenging and pushing back and saying, why am I making this decision? Help me. And that's a, that's a question that I'm asking people regularly. Now, this is the situation that we're in. We need to put our heads together as a community. This is not us against you. This is not the developers against this person, against that person. We are not going to point fingers at one another. We're going to, we're going to have to put our heads together to figure this out because we are in a crisis. And every day we're arguing about this. 400 more people are moving in every single month. You divide that by four, that means 100 people every week. That's what 5,000 is every week. 100 people are moving in every week. So while we are talking and going back and forth and exchanging emails, there are people that are moving in 100 people every week. That's 20, 20 people a day if we don't count the weekends or something. So just it's, it's a big, major issue. And I think a few things that I've learned from our council is, guys, we cannot get, and I'm probably going to receive emails from residents for this one, that uh, we have to just be thick skinned. You know, people are not going to like you for approving, you know, uh, these developments, or, but you have to make a decision to ensure that we do our part in providing the supply. 
The housing crisis will not go away until there is enough supply. And there are a spectrum of houses that we're talking about. There is affordable housing, and then there are people that are coming with their family, three uh, three kids, and they want a three-bedroom. You know, um, we want to ensure our developers are building the three bedrooms, just one bedroom. But there are families moving in here. So it's a controversial one, Chris. It is tough. It is hard. And we get emails regularly where people are saying, how dare you approve this? Why would you approve this? And my response to it is because we have a housing target hit. We have a timeline as well. I don't think people know this. If we go beyond the timeline, and I don't know the numbers, and I know my my uh, the housing team, they're going to slap my, they're going to slap their heads when they hear this interview. Like I tell you this every week, Io. <laughs> but from a time an application comes in to when council approves, there is a time yeah. that we have to do. I believe it's 120 days or something like that. Anything beyond that, the developer can appeal and go to. Um, um, the land tribunal for this. And at the end of the day, now we are paying extra money because we dragged a decision as a council. So they have been drilling that into our heads. We have a timeline. We have a timeline, sir. We have a timeline. We got to go through a timeline for this. Bill 24 came in and I don't think many people read it or understood the changes that came with, you know, with that bill. And, I'd make um, a bad partisan joke right now about did actually any of the MPPs read it, but I'm not going to because I'm not that type of person. I, <laughs> I, I, I did not say anything. I did not say anything. <laughs> but that bill changed a whole lot of things. And yeah. I think as a city, we might also have to do a better job of educating our residents on what has changed, what is changing, how that is impacting us, how that impacts our influence and our power, and how that sometimes ties our hands behind our back, you know, with certain things. I'm so not sure ask, people are aware of it. And can we I need ask to the do flip a question a little bit here? Go because ahead. Yet again, I'm cautious of time here, because I know you are a busy counselor and, I, and a busy man, so I want you to get back to your job. But I've got to ask the flip question to the original question that I started segment two on. And that is, what does Kitchener get right? What is the thing that you look at the city of Kitchener and you say, okay, we might be struggling. We might be having our challenges with the housing crisis, but at the end of the day, Kitchener is getting it right in this aspect. What is that aspect for yourself? I would say we have a really good team. We have a great mayor who connects very well with the community, who is loved by the community. You don't want to hang out with him outside of the community. It's like one after the other. They want to talk to him. They want to have conversations. He's just that, you know, uh, great with people. So we have a really good mayor, number one. Number two, we have a good council relationship. We do not agree on everything, but I I feel there is really strong respect that people have for one another. I remember one of my counselors did not agree with the decision one day and said, I do not agree with this decision. I'm still going to vote against this decision. But it seems the majority is going a particular direction. I respect that, and I'm willing to support it, even though I don't agree with it. That is a big deal. Now, this is my first time being on a council. I have been reading about some other councils. I'm not going to mention any names in any places, Chris. But I've been reading about some other councils, and I am blown away by the things that I'm reading, the things that I'm seeing, that I'm hearing from other places. And um, so I would say... The team, somehow, some way, we found a way to work well together, even though we don't agree on everything. Number two, the relationship with our leadership team, our CAO and the senior staff, they have the freedom to challenge us. I remember I was speaking to my CAO one day and I was not really, not really happy about a decision. And he challenged me right to my face. And I appreciated that he did that. He did it respectfully. But it challenged me to my face, gave me some things to go think about. You know, uh, I appreciate that kind of relationship where there is the re mutual respect on both sides. You know, nobody crossing any boundaries or anything like that, but mutual respect on those sides. So I think as a team, we get we, we work well together. I think financially, we're doing very well as a city as well. Um, even this year, when we went through our budget, our budget was at pace of inflation. 
we did not go crazy. Yes, we understand there's still a lot of work that needs to be done, but we have figured out a way to stay, you know, within our limits. Don't do anything crazy. In fact, we're building a new um we're building a new uh park in, in my in my community, recreational park. It's gonna be nice, beautiful, amazing. It's in Ward Five, which is so exciting. But I remember staff saying to us, we're not building anything for the next 10 years, team. We all need to come to that agreement. We're not going to do anything like this for the next 10 years. So are we all in agreement? <laughs> you know, like I appreciate that they push and share that with us. We make the final decision, but they provide their recommendations yeah. to us. And we need to trust that. And they also need to trust us because we have to balance their recommendations with what we're hearing and what we're seeing as well. So I would say those three things really, really makes a big difference for us. Trust me, I, I've, I've, I've sat down with some of those counselors from across Canada who are going through some challenging council meetings. So I, I, I understand where you're coming from. Again, without naming any names here, without naming any names, but if you want to listen to some great interviews, I would recommend going back and listening to all the cross-border interview podcasts. Um, <laughs> I want to turn to my last subject. Oh, we're going to get we're going to get many emails. <laughs> oh, this is great. This is great. I'm, this is airing the week that I'm gone to uh, Regina and Brandon, Manitoba. So I'm not even going to be near my email. So I won't even be hearing any of all these emails until the end of April. Um, so I want to turn to my last segment. And it's my favorite one. And it is about tourism. Because I am coming to mm -hmm. Kitchener later on this year. Uh, I'm doing a massive swing through southwestern Ontario because I've made okay. a promise and last year I wasn't able to make uh, keep it, but I'm going to keep it this year. So I've got to ask the counselor, where are the tourist destinations that you recommend to people who come to Kitchener? Mm. Oh, my gosh. Okay. Well, first, you got to visit the Huron Natural Area. Why? Because it is in my ward. It is a beautiful, phenomenal place. Um where you get to uh, check out indigenous setting, where you get to uh, just, uh, we've just reserved this area. In the hustle and bustle of Kitchener, there is this quiet, large space where you can just get away from everything, walk around with family, have fun. We have our museum. It's called the museum. It's a great place for you to visit as well. Uh, there are different themes each week, so you never know what theme, uh, whether it's the dinosaur week or whether it's technology week, you never know, but come down and visit. Uh, the Kent Ceiling Waterloo uh, Museum as well. Uh, this one is located uh, um, on, I think it's Dune Street, I'm trying to remember the name of the street, but I don't remember. If you Google it, it will pop up, but it's a phenomenal, wonderful place for you to visit. Uh, it gives you the history of Kitchener, it takes you back in time. It's a great place. There is a great barbecue place that I think it's called Smokehouse Barbecue. Oh my gosh. Be ready, Chris, when you go there. Do not do not eat with a fork and knife. They will look at you weird if you ask for a fork and knife. They will provide it for you, by the way. But ensure you try out their barbecue ribs. You will get dirty. It will go all the way up here. Don't take any pictures while you're eating but just go have some fun. It's a beautiful place for you to visit as well. I would just give you those ones as some places that you can check out for now. Is Our there a place that you go? Village. All of them. I go to all of them. <laughs> but is there a place that you go to decompress after a long day? Is there a spot in your community in Ward 5 or across the city where you can go and escape the realities because you know that tomorrow morning you're going to have to get up and do the exact same thing all over again and make your community a better place than you left it the day before? I would say the Huron Natural Area. It's just so beautiful to walk through. It's just very quiet going through the trails. Um. Not many people go there anymore. I think after the pandemic, the numbers went down, which I appreciate because then it's very quiet when you're going through. You know, you can hear the birds chirping. You can hear the cars in the far distance. They're not necessarily there. It's just a beautiful, relaxing place. And it has its own little lake as well, which is just wonderful. So it's natural. It's beautiful. It's quiet. Check it out when you're in town. And my, wanna, the team will be willing to get, take you on a tour of it as well. Well, they, they hopefully, that's what I was going to say. Hopefully, when I'm in Kitchener, you and I can grab a go go grab some barbecues. I promise I won't bring any of the podcast equipment to record the endeavor of us eating without forks and knives. But that's just here or there. Uh, 
So I want to end on my last question because I think it's the important one that I've asked. So we started by talking about yourself. We're ending by talking about the city of Kitchener. What mm -hmm. makes the city of Kitchener such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family, Councillor? Oh, I arrived in Kitchener eight years ago. Prior to coming to Kitchener, I stayed in another city for probably about a month. The city was always moving. Everybody was all over. I don't think anyone said hi to me my one month while I was in the city. Kitchener is not that way. <laughs> your neighbors will know you. Your neighbors will say hi. Your neighbors will want to visit you. When we first moved there, our neighbors brought cookies. Our next door neighbor brought wine. And they were just introducing themselves to us. I was not used to that. That was beautiful. It was engaging. That is what Kitchener is about. You have neighbors that are caring. You have people that find ways to get together. You have a very diverse community that somehow respects one another, loves and cares for one another as well. Now, am I saying we're perfect? Absolutely not. We have our issues. We have our um, problems as a community. But I love Kitchener because the people care about one another. They care for one another. And they always find ways to get together, especially in the summertime. And that's what just makes Kitchener a very special place. And, oh, by the way, you can get from one end of Kitchener to the other end in 16 to 20 minutes. It used to be 15 minutes. I used to say 15 minutes about five years ago. But now you can get anywhere in Kitchener in 16 to 20 minutes. I don't even use my GPS most of the time. I just know that it's going to take 16 to 20 minutes. Um, counselor, I want to thank you. I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for sitting down and doing this interview. Um, I'm not saying anything, but my my track record for having municipal leaders from the city of Kitchener on this show has been quite good. So maybe there's a leveling up here to a provincial MPP in your future, because the last time I sat down with someone from Kitchener, she went on to become the first green MPP from Kitchener Center. So who knows? Uh, the cross-border interviews works in mysterious ways. IO, Counselor, thank you so much for doing this. This has been a hilarious, fantastic, almost hour conversation with you. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much for tuning in for another great episode. If this episode sparked your interest, hit that subscribe button now. Stay in the loop with all our diverse content covering everything from the municipal affairs to the in-depth conversations with municipal leaders from across Canada here on the cross-border interviews, or even the decisions local governments make in the political trenches, local government at work. Now, we are your go-to platform for comprehensive municipal coverage, committed to keeping you well-informed as well as engaged. But your support is the backbone of our growth and the maintenance of this top-notch content you have come to enjoy. If you can, Consider backing the show. Every contribution, big or small, goes a long way in amplifying the depth and the breadth of our programming. Find the support page link on the Cross Border Interviews website. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, but as always, just keep talking. <laughs>